Mr. Dreyfus. Mr. Heaney? I would say great to see you in the flesh, <laughs> but uh, here your avatar is introduced in post. Uh, appreciate you giving me some of your time, my man. It's been, I don't know. Forever? 10 years, really? probably. Has, really? <laughs> yeah, uh, I left, it, I left World Cup in somebody, 2011. Every time somebody brings it up, it makes me feel old. <laughs> like, you know, when the movies came out, it's been 10 years, like, how? Like where does it all go? Down the down the spiral of life, I guess, or up the spiral of life, I guess, depending on your uh, perspective. So, for anybody who's listening, Leo and I worked at a company called World App some time ago, also known as Cal's Social Experiment. Um, man, I learned so much at that place. Fascinating, fascinating business, fascinating individual. I actually just had breakfast with him a few weeks ago on his way back from India en route to uh, Costa Rica. But what are you up to these days, Leo? I'm still selling software, so my story is pretty simple. Um, uh, it's an interesting question, I suppose. Uh, I, as I said, I'm not I'm not doing much. I, I suppose I, I'm still a little bit on a journey of I don't know whether it's, whether it's self discovery or, or uh, self improvement. I'm not really sure. The I've done software pretty much uh, most of my life. It's it's uh, uh, I started in IT way back in the early '90s, and uh, well, and you know, I, I've been doing IT or IT related things ever since. But the further I got in my arc in life, uh, there was a certain level of, of, I started gaining a certain level of dissatisfaction. Mm. And uh, what it was, was that all of my brilliant solutions that I came up with, uh, a, I couldn't tell my friends about it and go, hey, look at the thing I did, <laughs> right? Because, <laughs> because nobody cares. It, it's just like, hey, you're saying that the thing works now. Uh, but also, it's like every few years, like it would disappear and a new thing would come in place. And in my youth, that was perfectly fine. I was solving problems. I was having fun doing it. Uh, and, and it was great. But there was, um, uh, I think when I got into some kind of physical making at some point, I don't remember exactly when this happened. Uh, it reminded me that even the crappy ashtray, which ages me right there, the ashtray that we made in in <laughs> school <laughs> as kids, because that's what kids should do is make ashtrays. Um, like the, the lumpy thing that you would have to tell somebody what that was. Um, as old as it was, you would hold it up and go, hey, you know, I made that. And there was a certain sense of pride with it. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, I remember I took home ec in, in high school and I sewed my mother this apron, which was still, you know, I have no idea where it is. It's, it's long gone, but I still have that sense of pride in like, I did a really good job on that. Um, and it got me thinking in that, uh, there's a lot of, in the modern world, the things that we work on, uh, the great things that we accomplish are extremely transient. Whether it's a report that you did, hey, I did the yearly report. You wouldn't believe how much effort I did, and it was a brilliant report. And, well, you know, and 10 people cared. And sure, it helped the company, and you enjoyed making something useful, but it's not something that you'll put on your mantelpiece and you'll show friends or that you'll look at yourself and have that sense of pride in self. Mm -hmm. And so for the past, uh, what is it, 22? The, for the past, I don't know how many years, uh, it's always been a side hustle for my brain to think about improving life through uh, making physical things, even little things around the home or for friends or whatever, that uh, you you would get a greater derivement of pleasure uh, from its existence. I forgot what the question was. <laughs> I asked what you were up to these days. <laughs> Uh, so still, I appreciate the circuitous <laughs> answer. Uh, yeah. Um, well, so right now, it, uh, extremely, extremely to my right, uh, directly to my right is actually a brand new uh, little CNC machine. Um, 
which uh, can carve things out of, out of wood and metal and plastic, and, and it has great detail and uh, some neat things. And uh, I'm so, is this learning... the inverse of a three D printer? It's a it's something that deconstructs a solid object into a detailed yeah. object. And even a three D printer, they're all CNCs and, and stuff like that. But it's uh, CNC traditionally refers to a subtractive method. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are drill bits and, and gouges and stuff. Um, and uh, every couple of years, I, I like to pick up a new technology uh, and learn it. And this is the latest thing. So uh, literally before I got on here, I, I was looking through uh, data sheets on on feed rates and and, uh, and ty types of bits and all sorts of great. But it's, uh, I, I learn a new tech and I think, hey, this will be my thing. Uh, and it never is because a few years later, I, I'm like, hey, look at this other piece of tech. I bet that'll be interesting to learn. And I did figure out about myself that it's, I, I enjoy the learning new things and broadening my scope. And I can only do the same thing for so many years before I get bored with it. Uh, it's a blessing and a curse. I can definitely appreciate that. I've, um, I've found that to be true for hobbies and, you know, different exercise regimens, whether it was, you know, Spartan races or CrossFit or just different things that are really exciting. And, you know, I can throw myself fully into it for a certain period of time and it's measured in years, but not decades. Um, and I've always sort of envied people who can completely commit to something over very long periods of time. Well, I wonder, Oh, go ahead. No, no, uh, please. I, I, I have a tendency to interrupt. So you go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if there's a vocation in that somewhere where there's, you know, constantly feeding the mind and sampling new things and, you know, going the first, because there's a lot of 80, 20 in learning new things. And, you know, the last 20% of mastery can take 8,000 of the 10,000 hours as opposed to, um, you know, the first pieces, because like thinking about picking up guitar, the amount of progress you make when you pick up guitar for the first, let's call it three months is extraordinary. You're like, wow, I, this is, I don't want to say it's easy, but it's like, wow, this is real progress. And then all of a sudden, you know, you just hit this wall where the novelty sort of wears off and the real requirement of just sort of continuous either rote memory work or just repatterning to get your, your mind and your body into a new, um, you know, muscle memory. I'm, I'm, going to un, I'm going to ungraciously label that the grind. That's right. Yes. <laughs> and once you hit the grind, you know, there's a lot of benefits for people who push through that, right? That's how you become exceptional. But I do wonder if there's something to be said about, you know, the jack of all trades, master of none. I, I think there's something about the world we're entering where there's a higher value on that than there might have ever been given the pace of change in the world, because you almost can't predict like what's going to be needed 10, 20 years from now. Uh, it, I, I don't, I don't disagree. It's very hard to predict, um, the future, uh, let's see, let's see. Um, what, are you answering emails? <laughs> no, no. Um, uh, it, you, uh, the jack of all trades, the original quote, um, the jack of all trades is a master of none, but oft times better than a master of one was the original quote. Ah, okay. Um, the, uh, so I, I, I'm with you on the, the grass seems greener for the people who can focus on it, on just a single thing and that's what they can do. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it, it leads to a very stable life. It's, it's marvelous. Um, but I, I think there's a trap of the grass is greener, um, where those people, some of those people look at, 
uh, people who can pick up new things easily or uh, so so many people have asked me like like how do you know so many things <laughs> it's like oh well because I, I I can't stop looking for new stuff it's uh you know but you know at the same time it, it I, I went through that uh, that questioning phase of like well should I be envious of the people who can focus on whatever like whether it's guitar playing or programming and like yep i i'm gonna do this for the next 40 to 60 years <laughs> which sounds like a horror story to me and, and you know it's like well how am i really envious of i'm envious of what they can accomplish but Not i wouldn't want to go yeah but i also wouldn't want to go through it to be able to accomplish the same thing like hey that's really cool I'd love to be able to do that, but I don't want to put in the work. <laughs> yeah. It's like Michael Phelps. It's it's great that you get, you know, two dozen Olympic medals or whatever, but I don't yeah. want to get up at 4 a.m. every day and spend eight hours in the pool and eat 15,000 calories a day. Yeah. Right? Like, that's just – no, thank you. And that's, a, that's the thing. I think a lot of people go through that with uh, with guitar playing. They, they, they get to the point and you go, hey, you know, I tried this, and you know what? I don't want to do this this much. Right. <laughs> Uh, but there are things that you get into, like whether it's a Spartan racing or whatever, and you're like, you know what, I want to do more of this, and then you fall out. So, uh, you know, it's it's there's no such. I don't think believe I blah, 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 sentences. Um, I don't believe that there's such a thing as uh, the better path. Uh, you know, the world needs all kinds. Uh, it needs the the best example I've ever heard of this is the world needs the people who can build and live in the cities uh, because that builds society. It allows for uh, factory and learning and the spread of knowledge. But society also needs those people that uh, will go out into the wilderness alone and explore and find new things and resources. Uh, and if those people are put into cities and societies, they're going to end up murdering people because that's, that's their temperament. Uh, but we need those explorers so that we can find the new things and the new concepts and new everything. Um, and the city people can't survive in the wilderness. The wilderness people do not do a good job of surviving the city. And we also need those people who are like half and half, who run the outposts, <laughs> where they could just be enough of the city and just enough of the wilderness. And so I think anything you look at, there's... Uh, there's a lot of false dichotomies in the world, and, and it's 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 rather interesting. It's, it's always like there's all you know there's two people, uh, two types of people, and uh, the best quote I heard about that recently was two types of people avoid both of them. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, uh, it's interesting yeah. the notion of um, matchmaking, and one of the biggest challenges that companies have, for instance, especially once you get to a certain size is making sure that you have the right people in the right seat mm. because somebody might be fledgling in a certain role and it could be because they have a certain type of manager or they're assigned a certain type of work or, you know, there's something about the environment that's not quite right. Whereas you move them over, you give them a new project, a new leader, and all of a sudden they're like a hyper performer. And I think it's, it's not dissimilar from the notion of like, okay, it, who needs to be in this constant learning mode and exploration mode, right? The, the intrepid, uh, you know, almost hero who's on the, you know, constantly going out and risking annihilation at the edge of the horizon to come back with new knowledge, but, you know, is, is not going to be the one who's going to tend the farm and actually make sure people eat. Um, but the, but to your point, we need all of those things. And I wonder how much of technology that's in play will be used because it absolutely could be used. You look at chat GPT and the shit that we've got coming out, like there's no question in my mind that the technological capacity exists to solve for these kinds of problems. But I'm curious if we will stop wasting so much fucking time trying to get people to click on links in ads and actually invest our best and brightest resources on things like fulfillment and, you know, matching people into, um, 
places where they can thrive, whether it be personally or professionally. Did, did you watch, uh, I think I sent you a link to a, uh, a Jordan Peterson interview with uh, a lady uh, this past week. I haven't had a chance to listen to it. It's queued up. Uh, th this, is, this is actually what uh, she talks about. And uh, so the reason I, I sent that to you specifically is uh, uh, you've mentioned the, uh, in the past, the, the kind of visual, not the visual thinker that you are, but like when you close your eyes, you don't see. Yeah, aphantasia. And uh, part of what she was talking about was the different types of thinkers, the people that think in images, in words, in images, but it's mathematical, not the other kind. And it's, uh, uh, you, you, if you listen to her life arc, <laughs> it's, it's all over the place. Uh, you know, she, she redesigned, I guess, uh, the, uh, a, a whole bunch of systems about how we process cows so that they're happy cows. <laughs> And a bunch, and like, and what she ended up designing is now used by Burger King and McDonald's and a bunch of other, like, huge corporations. She's worked with Disney, and right now she's focused. She's focused on uh, education and how we are. Our current school system is missing the proper uh, attending to the different types of, think of thinkers. Mm -hmm. Which and never mind the school system. You know all these disgusting, wokeified, ultra-progressive companies who are virtue signaling 24-7. Not that I have an opinion on it, but I don't see a fucking thing being done to address people who think differently, right? So now that I'm a, you know, whether it's disabled or differently abled, however you want to call it, I take a step back and I look at like what accommodations are made for someone who is in my condition, nothing. And it's not like I'm quote unquote special. I mean, I guess you could say it's unique, but like everybody has different ways of comprehending information. Not everybody is going to take information in through a video or through, you know, rote memorization or through role play or whatever. Like not everybody's going to do that. And I have seen literally nothing from very large corporations, thousands of people to address it in the least. Meanwhile, you know, they're out there touting that their, uh, you know, diversity and inclusion and blah, 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 blah. And it's like, okay, I appreciate that, you know, people from different uh, ethnic groups are going to have, you know, different perspectives on things, but you cannot tell me that the color of somebody's skin is somehow materially more important to how they do a job than how their fucking brain works. Like, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Again, not that I have a strong opinion yeah. on it. I, so, uh, I, I believe the claim is not, uh, that their skin color will affect how, what their job performance is. I think the claim is, that uh having more diverse skin colors and in their concept it's uh skin color is equivalent to life experience yeah. um and that more different skin colors equates to uh more perspectives in the workplace which will create better product now i haven't seen any data that that would suggest that but uh, I would say at the at the senior level, like at a board level, especially, I actually fully agree with that concept that if you stuff a room full of people between 50 and 70 years old and they all have the same socioeconomic background and they all came up through the same, you know, five schools, you're putting you're setting yourself up for a serious black swan event because you're going to get caught flat footed, not seeing a really major thing that's going to, you know disrupt your business. So at that level, I completely agree. What's ironic though, is the change is primarily happening at the bottom to mid levels, right? Like you don't see giant sweeping changes up in the senior executives. Now, I also appreciate that like you have to have been a junior analyst to eventually make it to a C-suite. So we've got a pipeline problem. Um, but I, I don't know that at the lower levels, it has the same uh, impact, right? Like as an individual programmer, 
right? If my task is to create some subroutine that efficiently executes X, does it matter if I grew up, you know, in Harlem or Kansas or fucking Hawaii? Like how, how would that bear on the extremely discrete task to which I've been assigned? That, that type of work is unclear to me how uh, diversity plays in. Now, I also appreciate that when offices existed, there's something to be said about the dynamic of a team, right? And how people collaborate together and what kind of ideas get batted around. Um, but at the individual contributor level, I'm much more speculative. I'm not sure how many individual contributors we really have nowadays. I'm just thinking when I was in Chicago, uh, I had a programming team and uh, my lead programmer was a guy from India. Um, his second was uh, a Chinese fella. Uh, we had another Indian female and our like immediate kind of QA was a Chinese lady or Korean or something like that. Uh, but it was a, it was a very diverse Heavy team Asian from, team, from it like, sounds like. Uh, yeah, but the thing is, so, like, uh, two of them were completely American, right? So it's just like the history of was from these places. But uh, it's like people ask me, uh, you know, where are you from? Uh, and uh, like, I was born in Russia. You know, it, it doesn't mean that I like borscht, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like I, grew, I grew up mostly in America. You don't, you don't like hot dogs. Um, so you don't like a good bush? Come on. I, I, I was never a fan of bush. Well, you know, it could be that uh, if you grew up there and that's uh, your main staple, <laughs> that it's not so great uh, as opposed to like, you know, occasionally. Have, there, there are some Russian foods I love. Uh, Salad Olivier, uh, which uh, uh, it's kind of like a potato salad, sort of. Okay. Uh, but it's got it's got meat in it and, and stuff. It's... Uh, it was, it was actually created by a French chef for one of the Russian Tsars, uh, if I remember. I love that. It, it, the Russian salads, I like uh, the fact that they serve uh, you know, raw salmon and stuff as a, as a party dish when they have a party. It's a, it, the, the Russian table is a very different layout. You know what I don't American quite get party. is the pickles and vodka. What's that about? Um, I, I can't say for pickles except for uh, I don't know that I've known a Russian that didn't like pickles. And, uh, well, you know, vodka. So <laughs> I, actually, I, I don't know if you're drinking anything. I have, I have two drinks with me right here. Some, uh, green tea with ginseng and honey. And I'm currently sipping on some, uh, Belle de Brie, uh, cognac with, uh, with, with a pear flavoring to it, which is marvelous. Very nice. I actually, uh, I recused myself of alcohol on January 1st, 2020. So I'm now three years, quote unquote, sober. Uh, so I'm drinking a glass of kava tea, which is a Pacific Island root uh, tea that is very elaborate to prepare. I have it most nights. Um, it's a brilliant uh, relaxant, um, but it tastes like mud. And Leo, mm. when I say mud, I mean, literally, it tastes like drinking mud. <laughs> now, how I know what mud tastes like, you ask? Well, because <laughs> I played football and I did Spartan Sports races. Racing. and I had enough <laughs> mud enter my mouth to know roughly what it tastes like. Um, so it it's clear to me why this is not more popular, because it's quite effective, um, you know. So I, it was very odd to me that not more people knew about it. Um, anyway. Yeah, I'm, I'm drinking the Belle de Brie because I, uh, uh, to a certain extent, I have social anxiety. And uh, I don't know if you've noticed in the, in the various meetings that, that we may have uh, sat on, I, I mostly sit there quietly and listen. And then at the end, you know, I'll speak up and, and dynamite drop out. Um, but uh, a lot of it has to do with uh, at, a, at a party, I'm generally quiet. Uh, alcohol tends to loosen my speech. So. I am familiar with this dynamic. I think my speech would often get a little too loose. <laughs> One of the primary reasons why I decided to uh, separate the damn myself. Damn companies. <laughs> and, that's, <laughs> and that's under T. <laughs> that's right. Well, so uh, I'm going to toss this out here. Um, well, like normally I, I, I like to have uh, 
uh, topics. So like, you know, well, we, we talked about this, like I have topics so I could think about it and bring a better uh, uh, thought process to it. I'm a, I, I tend to be a slow thinker. Um, so like, you know, after whatever we discussed today, over the next week, my brain will process through and analyze mm -hmm. and not like the, oh, this would have been a good, good comeback, but like the, uh, is this, does this make sense? Is that the truth? Let's test it against some, you know, various, various concepts and, uh, uh, and come to the, the truth of, of the matter. It's uh, one of the, well, actually one of the things I, um, I started pursuing at some point was uh, a little bit more trying to understand the truth of things. Hmm. And uh, it's, it's a, uh, it's odd because there's a lot of uh, statements <laughs> out there. Uh, and it's like, well, how do you come to the truth of things? Uh, how do you know it's true? And uh, there was, there was a lot of um, stumbling, stumbling around, but I, I stumbled across libertarians, which are an interesting group. Uh, I think a lot of them are on the autism scale. If you spend any time in their chat rooms. <laughs> I think uh, they have a lot of arrested development. I find they, that the, the concepts are, they're very attractive, but in an adolescent way, in a way that like, you just haven't learned to think more completely to understand why it's too complicated for these things to actually work in the ways in which they're presented. That's an interesting thing because uh, I actually find them to be mostly very good thinkers. And one of the uh, things that they tend to do is think, well, one, I, I find out of uh, all the political groups that I'm familiar with, uh, they are the best researched. Yes. Because <laughs> sure. they, they will research the bejesus out of whatever yes. it is. They have highly highly entrenched positions but they are entrenched positions but they are non-trivially acquired right they didn't get it from a talking point on cnn or fox they got it because they read very deeply about something and researched to the corners and decided that this is um you know it makes the most sense right this is the most rational position to take well, so uh, I don't know how familiar you are with, with libertarianism. Uh, so libertarianism is based on a single principle. Are you, are you familiar with that? Uh, possibly, but I... Uh, so it's called, it's called the NAP, N-A-P, uh, which stands for non-aggression principle. And it's uh, shortly could be translated into don't lie, don't start fights, and uh, stick to your word, which uh, a lot of the language it tends to be a uh, uh, contract around contracts. So stick to your word would be a contractual thing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, under under the hardcore libertarians, whatever uh, concept uh, you're talking about in in the government, or should you do this or that, uh, they will attempt to uh, start at the nap and get there to figure out if, the, if it's good or bad. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's a fascinating thing, because uh, I, I would say the best thing I've, I've heard about how to describe it, it's like, well, don't start fights, don't lie, and, and uh, this other thing. That's what we teach our kids. Right. <laughs> you know, so there, there's a certain, like, that's not a bad base for principles. And considering neither of the major political parties seems to have any principles, these are the only ones that I found that kind of like, well, at least I understand where you're coming from. Uh, and you may be right or wrong, but you know, you throw it in a forum and a bunch of people will artistically, you take it apart, but then you'll go, this is the stance <laughs> based on the nap. Um, so I, but I, I also couldn't completely embrace it because there are the, like uh, it's, for those who are unfamiliar, libertarianism basically um, says that you can get along without government. Um, the number one response to that is, <laughs> according to the libertarians who like to make fun of that response, is who's going to build our roads? <laughs> um, and really, the argument gets, uh, or let's say the discussions uh, become fascinating because it's like, well, that's an excellent question. Who would who would build our roads? And there's a lot of examples, evidently, of people building and fixing roads without government help. 
And it goes back into history. Uh, you know, how did we build roads before, you know, government got involved and why would anybody build a road? And so they have a lot of these concepts, uh, which were appealing. I don't know if they would completely work. Uh, and this was, and, and this is another part of like learning how to think. So I got into, so I'm, I'm going to skip around because I, and I'm not taking notes to remember to go back to certain topics. <laughs> But I got introduced to libertarianism, which uh, had this interesting concept of building on a principle. The other things that they exposed me to were logical fallacies. Uh, and you're familiar with those? Mm -hmm. Right. So for, I, I don't know if I need to keep explaining, like for those people unfamiliar with logical fallacies, because this was not something I learned about in school. <laughs> I learned about it in my 30s or 40s or something uh, from the internet through libertarians who would say, well, that what that person said could be completely uh, ignored because it's a logical fallacy. I'm like, well, what the hell are you talking about? It's like, they'd say, well, the logical fallacy that they used is an ad hominem, you know, or it's a straw man or it's a this or a that. And it's basically a way of, uh, you know, if Matt is telling me, uh, you know, this is the way things should be. And I go, well, yeah, Matt, but, uh, you know, you also used to do Spartan racing, right? You know, and I'm making fun of you for doing something, but I'm not addressing your argument at all. Right. And but I'm addressing you or your history or, or something else. And it's called an ad hominem attack, but it's taking away from the actual argument. Uh, and evidently, this is uh, something very well, very popular. It's it's a core of the people who have ever taken a debate class. This is core in being able to debunk what your opponent is saying mm -hmm. and after i learned and read up on, on <laughs> well i didn't learn and read it read up on the on the thousands literally thousands of logical fallacies out there but once i had like 10 or 20 under my belt i couldn't watch the news anymore because it's all <laughs> it's all logical fallacies and lies and i'm like i can see it now because I can hear how you're putting forth the arguments and they're not real arguments. So that mm -hmm. was like another step in my, uh, in opening up my thinking. Uh, but it's a lot of it. It's like, how can I really exclude information so I can process what's left? And um, uh, by the way, I'm going to ramble and babble. So if, if you want to, you know, sort of, sort of direction or interrupt, feel free. Don't, <laughs> Wait for me to pause. <laughs> no, let me just let me defend my position of why I made the claim that I think that because I think of libertarian in the like political arena, right? Mm -hmm. And some of the things that are put forth in terms of like abolish all government, basically, mm -hmm. right? And it's not that it's a terrible idea; it's that it's a ridiculously impractical idea because. In the same way that, like, Democrats saying take away everybody's guns is a preposterous proposal because we have over 300 million weapons in the hands of people who would rather die than give them up. So to start with a plan that is going to fail, obviously, and no matter what, to me, demonstrates an incomplete level of thinking. Yeah, well, so I, I will make uh, the following two modifications. Uh, I find uh, a, lot of, a lot of libertarians uh, want no government. They're, a lot of their things is, is actually minimalist government. Um, because I, I've then stumbled across uh, anarchists and anarchists who literally want no government. Yeah. And their ideas, believe it or not, uh, I, well, part of it is who's delivering the message and how good are they at explaining their ideas actually sound better. But I don't think it's a overnight thing. Like, you know, democracy and capitalism can be good, but what happened to the Soviet Union after it collapsed uh, and got democracy and capitalism was a horror show. <laughs> but it's because nothing can be done overnight. I think the way that you have to look at uh, uh, any political uh, party is that it's really setting a direction. And should the direction be towards less government? Yes, and, that's a good point. And I think currently the answer would be yes. And Holy at some shit, point yes. on the <laughs> uh, and at some point on the way to anarchy, you might go, 
you know what? Maybe a step too far. Let's back up a little bit. <laughs> Which is a really great point, actually, yeah. right? Because if you look at um, on the spectrum of conservatism, which is change nothing, and liberalism, which is change everything, in order for you to stop dragging gay people behind trucks in Texas, you need to over rotate, and suddenly we've got 93 genders, right? And it's like, okay, well, now it's okay to be gay and we don't just like kill people in the streets for it. But now we've got to deal with pulling this thing back from the ledge. So it's a good point. You know, it's, we have to continuously adjust fire depending on where are we relative to what potentially could be considered the ideal. And I, it, you would be hard pressed to find a sane human in this country right now who Period. thinks. <laughs> 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 period, but also with the caveat of who thinks we need more government because they're so competent at dispensing funds in useful ways that we should increase and and who are responsible when they are provided power, right? I, I mean, if anybody currently thinks that, I just, I don't know what to say. I feel like we're living entirely different realities. No, and, and this is where, you know, I, I kind of wish like uh, we were in the same place with a really, really big whiteboard. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, uh, so I, how, how I'm going to, I'm going to say some things. The, the destination is going to be, uh, what do you think the biggest problem in the country is? Uh, but the preface to that is, is as follows. Uh, the, when you're talking about, you know, people thinking that the government uh, is running things well, uh, last I checked, uh, the approval rate, rating of Congress is under 20%, and it has been for literally decades, right? So it's, it's nothing new, but the same people keep getting voted in, mm -hmm. right? Um, and the only way I can think of that is like, oh, well, you know, it's all the other congressmen that are the problem. <laughs> uh, but it can't be my guy or girl. It's got to be right. this other one. Uh, but uh, so, you know, when you say that people can't possibly be thinking that they're doing their job, and yet we keep voting in the same people. So there, there's an interesting thing there. Um, the other bit is that uh, I, I don't know that anybody thinks that they're spending money wisely, I think a lot of it, uh, and I've, I've been giving this a, a little bit more, maybe not as much thought as I should have been if I, if I really have a solid interest in this. Um, I, I, I've been a little, I've blackpilled myself regarding the government, which uh, I'll, I'll ask me about that later, uh, later tonight. Um, the, uh, the issue would seem to be that, uh, so I'll give you my, what, what I think the problem is. Um, the problem is lack of education. Uh, the education does not come from the schools. The education needs to come from the parents so that the parents properly educate the kids so that what they do learn in school gets properly processed. Uh, there are core things missing, such as what is critical thinking. A lot of people think, yeah, I do think critically. Great. Tell me what the process for that is. And they're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> right. Well, well, critical thinking is a process. Uh, but critical thinking is useless unless you understand what logical fallacies are so you could exclude bad data. And most people don't know what logical fallacies So there's like all of these things. Yeah, that... it wouldn't take a lot to create a great thinker. Like the number of ways that you can lie with statistics and represent correlation as causality, for instance, that if we had trained people wait, to wait, uh, spot wait, I'm gonna, that. I'm going to interrupt you. So on my path to the, to the, to the, uh, whatever I said our station was, if you didn't write it down, nobody knows. Um, the, so we, so we have uh, basically parents not teaching the kids, the internet and the schools are teaching the kids. Mm -hmm. uh, what the kids are learning on the internet and in schools uh, and for more than 20 years now, uh, aside from that there are 90 genders or whatever, uh, that the world is literally coming to an end. Right. Right. But this but the way that it's being presented to the kids is 
uh, a highly stress-inducing fact because they see Greta Thunberg talking to the UN. They see uh, my eyes the, are going to roll out of my head. They, they're going to see the uh, the U.S. politicians repeating the information, whether they're senators or the president. The news keeps repeating the information that the world is going to end in ten years. Mm -hmm. And if you can imagine, like I don't know if you can remember uh, approximately what it's like to be. Well, you have kids, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so, so you, this is actually fascinating. I, you know, not to not not to be taken out of context. I like watching kids. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because, uh, because because I, I like to see how they view the world. It's a, it's a it's a fascinating like. Step I love back listening into, to my yeah. kids asking questions. I love hearing the way in which they view something, and the critical way in which they try to unpack it. It's fascinating. Now imagine with your limited knowledge as a kid, your teachers, the news. And the world government's telling you that the world is going to end in 10 years, mm -hmm. right? That would freak you out. I'm like, a scary movie would freak you out. <laughs> and this is literally all of the serious things that you know about, your teachers, the government, and, and uh, the news. All of the smartest people from your perspective are telling you the world is going to end. Uh, I imagine it's going to cause an inordinate amount of stress. Um, and... Uh, I can't imagine why we have the the anxiety and depression and obesity and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, rates that we have when people are living in fight or flight twenty four seven. But go on. Well, in that, so so that's it. The, the so you have this kind of situation where the kids aren't learning from the parents, and to a certain extent they can't because the parents don't know how to do any of this stuff either because they didn't learn. I. I don't know if it's even less so now that the parent can give the kid an iPad and off you go. <laughs> you know, hey, spend spend a few hours on Tumblr, parents. see what you learn. I think there's a very large range of approaches that people are taking. Well, because I do, like, you're right. I do see like smart kids and what, but it doesn't seem like it's the majority. Have you seen? <laughs> have you have you seen the? Uh, uh, I, I forget which, what the YouTube channel it is, but the guy goes out and he talks to people on the street and he asks them like really basic questions and whatever they say, he goes, yes. Yes. I've seen too many of those and it's right. horrifying. Right. But, but that's, that's the thing. Like I find it fascinating because the, like he'll occasionally come across a guy who actually knows all of his stuff. It was funny because it was, he, I think he worked at IT and he was with two of his friends and the friends didn't know. And he just answer, answer, and like he, he do everything. I'm like, okay. So, I'm wondering where the IQ, like how much of this is IQ and how much of this is schools? Uh, because I, well, I, I would imagine even if you have a low IQ, you have to know how many moons we have. You you go <laughs> through a terrifying process of considering the Gaussian distribution of IQ. And at the center of that bell curve is 100. If you spend enough time with someone with an IQ of 100 in deep conversation, and then you consider that 50% of people have a lower IQ than that, and I'm not trying to be disparaging of people because, you know, you, that's, there's not a whole lot you can do to change that. But it's pretty horrifying to consider that half of people who are all able to vote, by the way, are under that half of the curve. And, you know, I do think that there's some amount of it that's that, but n not most. I think the things that are required to do basic reasoning and understand basic constructs, like how many moons do we have, <laughs> um, you don't need to have a very high IQ for that. It's a matter of prioritization. And that is a cultural problem. Now, what do you mean by uh, part prioritization? Well, let's take a step back and do a little thought experiment. Let's say that you as a set of politicians are concerned with making sure that our constituency, the entire United States population, is as fit for service to their community and the country at large as possible while mitigating 
the largest amount of existential risk to that group. Okay. I can't think of anything that would be more important than helping people reduce their cortisol levels and understand the importance of proper diet and exercise. And it's very clearly not a priority for this country. We spend an amount of time I can't calculate that I consider utterly wasted worrying about assault weapons, a term that's not even defined, because a couple of dozen kids every couple of years get killed. And don't get me wrong, that's fucking tragic as hell. Now, but are you saying that politicians are worried about that? I'm saying that politicians, uh, it's a chicken and egg scenario. Is it the politicians that are worried about it? Is it the media that's worried about it? Is it the populace? But politicians and the media have the capacity to tell the truth and to tell a narrative that is not a, um, what's the fallacy thing? Logical fallacy, right? Mm -hmm. It is not actually something worth paying attention to. A few hundred people dying a year from assault weapons is not that big of a problem. Sorry, pumpkins. Hundreds of thousands of people are dying from obesity and obesity related disorders. Like what the fuck? It's not even close. We're talking about multiple orders of magnitude separation in terms of the scale of the problem. Well, so, so this is what I'm going to interject here. Um, the people aren't dying from assault weapons are mostly dying from handguns. Um, Which you know, is assault... an even, even right. better part of the example. Right. The, why the, are we paying so much attention to this? The, Most that, of the crime is happening with illegal weapons, first of all. So more laws isn't going to do shit. Well, number on, one, on. Well, I, I'm going to completely divert you here. That, that was that was really more of like a like a grammar correction more than anything okay, else that I just couldn't resist. Uh, the uh, the populace is, are, aren't the ones driving this. Uh, the ones driving this are media and politicians. Yes, uh, I agree. Me, but they're driving it to a certain extent for different reasons. Media is driving it because that's how they make their money. Right. If you're Correct. panicked, you will keep tuning in because genetically right. you're tuned into, I need to be aware of the danger. Yep. Uh, politicians will drive it because, hey, but if there's a bunch of people attuned to this danger, I can then use this to get them to vote for me. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't really blame the people for anything except for their, uh, I don't know, settling into their comfortable lives and not learning how to teach their kids or themselves. Well, um, it goes to the point of if you could critically think, you would look at the statistics and say, why are we spending so much time and money and attention? The most powerful thing in the universe is human attention. It's the only thing that can change the direction of the universe. Absent humans, the, the universe is nothing but an enormous Rube Goldberg machine. It's a fucking enormous set of if this than that. The only thing that can change that is human attention. And we fucking squander it on non-truths. Well, which again, I think goes back to education, but education goes back to government. Because it's government schools. And well, to what, answer what your the question, though, of what's the biggest, what do I think is the largest problem we have in this country? I think it's actually a, it's, it's, you're not wrong that that's an enormous problem, but that's not a, that solved, I don't think actually solves the other problems that we have, of which there are many. I think the number one problem we have today in 2023 as a society is institutional distrust. You virtually, unless you're completely asleep at the wheel of which there is a decent percentage, but the people who are smart, right? Who are well-read. When you say institutional can, distrust, do you mean uh, people don't trust the government? I'm going to go through the list in a second. All right. Anybody who has any sense of their wits about them, right? Who can think critically does not trust the government, the media, um, 
most corporations stated intent uh health care oh is my bank going to close my accounts after this conversation <laughs> okay sorry go ahead i can't make any promises um and then the, you can, oh the the uh the church and the judicial system so no one trusts anything so how do you get any sense of unity and alignment in that state of a system because if you imagine a ball right a giant boulder and you've got to apply force against it unless you can get all the force pointed in one direction it's just going to fucking sit there as all the forces rip into opposite directions and create a giant waste of energy expenditure, which is exactly what's happening everywhere you look in this country. Because nobody trusts anybody. The right doesn't trust the left. Right. The people don't trust fucking Elon Musk. The guy is out there transforming the world before our eyes, and he's suddenly been transformed into a demon. It's like, I, what? I, I think it might be easier um... – to to view this if you so this off the top of my head so uh it might be easier to view this as very much a conflict between the left and the right let's say between uh the dark side of the force and the light side of the force hey, oh hey, <laughs> look at that you're, you're there princess jedi this should this should be right in the ballpark here um and uh a lot of people i think uh got a little bit well a little bit confused they're a little bit confused because they're they're not trained to to think and rethink the same things over and over but um it's not that they have to be aligned in the same direction they simply have to be aligned in a, the opposite direction to the bad things you know to the 80 million nazis that are in this country so to speak um you know, if you right well but 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 that's but that's if that's exactly it is because when you listen to the rhetoric towards that group not the nazi group everybody else they're saying like hey look at all this bad we have to be aligned against it because if you look at how most people are voting they're not voting for a thing they're voting against right. the thing and that's where the motion actually comes from so in your it, what you're looking at is like oh well if i want to move something forward i can move it forward with this positive forward force but that's not how politics works now currently <laughs> Right. Where it works with this uh, this opposite negative force. Um, and I'm not sure how how long it's been going on, but I imagine if we look up the phrase uh, voting for uh, what's the the lesser evil vote for the lesser. Like if you find when that term started getting used, mm. vote for the lesser evil, this will give you an idea for how long we have been uh, basically framing this and that way like hey i'm not great but look at the other guy he's hitler you know obviously you have to vote for me and uh and and this is you know i know it's been quite a long time uh, i i just don't know exactly but that that's uh well, that's the only way you can explain the... how biden's in office it's fucking weekend at bernie's i mean the guy can barely yeah. complete a sentence but, but how did not, he get it's, there it's it's not biden it's uh because that's not how trump, trump got into office well, but that's it's how, not Biden. It's not right. Trump. But that's how Trump got into office. Is right. it's not Hillary? Not Hillary. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> you know. So, but this is what I mean. It's like I, uh, I, I imagine it was going on in the eighties. But it was like, ah, but they're not like really evil on the right or the left, you know. But if you keep doing it every four years, at a certain point, the evil just like, well, look, I just don't have to be quite that evil, but I could still be pretty evil. <laughs> Yeah, and we keep moving in the evil direction. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna in, uh, give you a little perspective that I had for for decades now, um, and it's it seems to apply to a lot of things. And this is this it applies here, which is why I'm going to share it. Uh, generally, in life, people are, and it, it could be more than people. It could be things, or uh, I'm not really sure. But I always used to think of this in terms of people um, are moving either in an upward spiral or a downward spiral. You're almost never neutral. Yeah, there's nothing static. You're either growing or collapsing. Yeah, and, and it's like, you know, but like when you look at the things that you're doing, are they helping you like even a little bit? And if they are, then they're helping you move in an upward spiral. And mm -hmm. if 
the things that you're doing and say, like, oh, well, you know, I've stopped going to the gym. I'm sitting in front of the television more. You know, I'm watching a lot of news. <laughs> it's like, well, OK, but now you're not exercising and you're watching really depressing content. You're adding to the downward spiral. And uh, so I, I think, you know, if people kind of analyze their life in that way, they could start cutting things out and go, oh, I, you know, so I need to get more on the upward. It doesn't have to be a straight upward arrow. You just have to spiral upward a little bit. Every right. every month, you know, in a few years, you'll be pretty darn good. But well, people don't understand the notion of compounding of gains. Well, so but if you take this to the uh, spiraling down with the lesser evil, mm -hmm. like well, I'm vote I'm not voting for the level two evil. I'm voting for the level one evil. Well, okay, great. We voted in level one evil, but we voted in yeah. evil. <laughs> yes. And, but then next year it's going to be a, so well, it's going to be a level three evil versus a level two evil, right? You know, and this is how we get to Biden, which I don't well, think and, he's running anything. It's it's somebody's running it, but it's of not. Of course, him. of course not. You know, he's and, not doing negotiations with China and, and Ukraine and Russia. Come on. And the question becomes, how if you step all the way back and say, we've got. 330 million-ish people in this country. Let's say that about 100 million of them are uh, eligible to be in office. I'm making it up, but let's just okay. use it as a, a round number. I'm good with that. You're, you're telling me out of 100 million fucking people? Okay, so then let's say 50 million of them are liberal. Out of 50 million people, the best candidate of 50 million is... Joe fucking Biden, get well, out of here! Okay, it's so, impossible. This is, so this is this is going to come into question of uh, weirdly in my world it comes out of economics. What do you mean when you say best? Most qualified to advance our country in the direction of a desirable goal, and I think one of the problems we have is we no longer have a shared set of values as a country. And that's one of the challenges of what happens when you bury religion is now all of a sudden you're shooting I, I don't, from the hip from a well, value. I don't, I, don't think, I don't think we ever had a shared set of values. Uh, well, I'm like, if you look at it, well, especially if you look at the religious stuff, you look back at uh, uh, during the colonies, right? And uh, uh, Massachusetts and uh, oh, I feel it was something south of them well obviously something south of them i, I can't remember the uh, the state but uh very very different because Massachusetts was, was very puritan and uh, there would be guys who would come up i'm going to say west virginia i don't know if it's actually west virginia but they would come up out of that state and they'd parade naked through the center of a church on sunday here in massachusetts just to fuck with the massachusetts puritans um you know there there were not uh agreements on practically anything back then uh except for um well I, i'm like even the constitution because uh you look at the amendments but pre-amendments it was the federalists and the amendments were practically a, a revolution on the on the federation uh the whole point back then was that the states wanted to rule mostly themselves and it's not that they had agreements between each other. That that was one of their big things that they didn't want the federal government. And that's the thing because... is I don't think you need agreement at a federal level, but you do need it at a state level. But we don't even have it at a municipal level. Well, not everybody lives in a place is going to think the same. It's, uh, uh, which, is, you... which, is, which poses a very interesting question, which is why I look at the libertarian concept and I say, well, that's cute. But it's never possible because until we go back to clusters of people under a thousand, well, I don't think we're ever going to reach a place where you can actually have pe true peace and prosperity because you will constantly have this infighting due to a clash of values. Well, well hold on, hold on. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to uh, take uh, a, uh, uh, What's, what's the devil thing where, where you're the devil's advocate or something? Devil's advocate, yeah. Devil's, okay, so I'm going to take the devil's advocate point here, and I'm going to channel the libertarians that I that I recall from, from when I was in the libertarian circles. Um, when you say it's not going to work, right, mm -hmm. uh, they're going to ask you for specific, like what, what exactly in the libertarian, like 
give, give me a solid example of like this thing is not going to work because somebody's going to disagree with it. Well, you can see like where vagueness. Yeah, yeah, of course. Like, eh. So th th it's just the scope of the number of things that would have to change to go from where we're at now to a libertarian utopia is measured in thousands of individual actions. And so it's tough to say like where to start to answer that question because you basically have to dismember everything that's not uh, interstate transport, defense, right? Like there's very few things that a true libertarian thinks that the federal government should have control over or their hands in, and we're in fucking thousands of things. Well, so, wait, wait, hold on, hold on. Okay, so are you saying that, they, that these things could not work without the federal, federal government or are you saying something else? No, I'm saying that to go from a state where you've got hundreds of thousands, actually millions of employees, right, attending to these things, to no longer attending those things, and okay, changing yeah. the entire right, way that the country right. operates. You're, 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 ta you're talking about things. the transition periods, correct? Right. It's just it's just like when when Russia just you know said, "Ha ha, welcome to democracy and capitalism." And people are like, what? You yes, know, because because they didn't have a good uh, like yeah. the unmitigated chaos of the well, highest order. Correct. If you, if you're talking about doing a Thanos and snapping your fingers, <laughs> right? Well, right. Well, th think about it. You know, Thanos killed you know half the people who know how the power grid works. <laughs> right. Right. You're gonna have a lot of chaos and death and everything else. Uh, I've killed the half the farmers. Holy crap! <laughs> um. So. Uh, so yeah, uh, I, I think that's just a. Uh, it's, I, I don't know that. Well, yes, yeah, so there are certainly libertarians who are like. Yep, if I'm president tomorrow, there right. is no government. Yeah, which is fine. You know, there are idiots on all sides. I would say uh, I have not heard a rational, and it's, I I could just not have researched it enough to be completely fair. I've never heard a rational off ramping plan of how we get from where we are today over a discrete, defined period of time where we're in libertarian utopia. Well, so uh, here, here's, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just toss out a couple of concepts. Um, Elon Musk bought Twitter. I don't know if you know. Oh, yes. I... <laughs> right. Uh, he fired what? Uh, 80%. Fired... fired 80%? Was it 80% of the people? He, he either fired or they self-selected out. Right. Okay. Is Twitter still running? It is. Okay. Now, if you would imagine almost any of a company where you removed 80% of the workers, would you think that the company could still function? Uh, software companies, yes. Um, you know, material goods companies like Amazon, I don't think you could fire 80% of Amazon warehouse workers and it would still function, right? So uh, I wouldn't use the Amazon workers. I would use the drivers because the... Yeah, uh, sure. What I'm saying well, is they like, have a lot of robots in the in the <laughs> where there's physical goods and physical things in the, in this world. Right. You know, to, but, to how we but, open the call, uh, but, but, I do not. But couldn't couldn't states take a lot of these uh, responsibilities onto themselves? Yes, and I hope that they do. And right. I think we're but, seeing the manifestation but, of that with Roe v. Wade. Right. Well, you know, there, there's there's one example, right? So again, it's not. Like uh, they would snap their fingers and everything would all of a sudden disappear, right? But it would be a thing of like, well, you know, do we need the Department of Education, right? And they would say, well, uh, you know what? It's going to be disbanded and the states have two years or three years or whatever they think it is to uh, create their own uh, ways to deal with it. But mm -hmm. it's going away. Um, the... While libertarians do talk about a lot of things, uh, do you know the the top two items on the libertarian agenda for what to kill in the federal government? No. Uh, the number, well, the, the, the top two, I don't know which one's number one, uh, but number one, uh, I would say, is the Fed, right? There's, federal Reserve? Yes, uh, because it prints money and it, uh, it manipulates the market in ways that are overall negative to the market. Uh, and the other thing is that uh, number two thing, I guess, would be wars. The other thing is that uh, the Fed also creates the money so that we can afford wars. Uh, but when libertarians again, libertarians, I've, I've literally watched arguments for over a week where they're arguing about how much light from your neighbor's 
you know, flood lamp can land on your property. <laughs> it was, <laughs> it was ridiculous. Uh, the, the, the one piece of sound logic, cause people were like measuring lumens and shit. <laughs> After a week, somebody came in and go like, dude, just don't be a fucking jerk. And that's how you're right. a libertarian neighbor. <laughs> I'm like, Hey, there you go. That's right. Um, but it's the, their, their concern is, uh, is let's stop fucking killing people. <laughs> so can we go to the Fed for a second? Because I think that's a really fascinating topic that very few people know anything about. Well, before we do that, can we agree we should just stop fucking killing people all around the world? <laughs> well, that's an interesting question, Leo. Can we? Can we well, agree on that? Because well, let's, pretend, <laughs> let's pretend for a second that pre-World War II, the United States had let's call it 200 military bases around the world. And let's say that today we've got over 20,000. And, you know, what would it really mean if we okay. reduced that back down to 200 and we no longer ran coups in countries to install US friendly leadership and we no longer, you know, did whatever, you know, 4D chess games we've got going around the world in terms of, you know, holding people politically hostage, you know, privatizing uh, utilities in favor of American companies and blah, 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 blah. The, the myriad things we do as a country to maintain this sort of superior status. Let, let me, let me rephrase my, my thing. Uh, is it is it more desirable that we have less war? Is that something we can agree on? I I would like to say yes, but right. it the problem with the question is it does not consider the consequence. If of less we went, war? yeah, so let's say there's less war in the world, and let's say the consequence of that is that we go through 200% annual inflation for a decade and the dollar is no longer the reserve currency of the world. And China is now the world power, so, right? Like sir, there's a series of things that could come out of the notion of less war because- sorry, why, why is there more inflation? Because we use our military to maintain superior status and to acquire superior trade rights and superior routes and superior political alliances. Like there's well, a I reason. We, I think we do that through mostly the petrol dollar. I don't disagree with you. What I'm saying is there is a web, a miasma of things that we do across our military, across the CIA, FBI, and the other alphabet boys we don't know about to prop up this illusion of superiority. But all of it at the end of the day is because there's a gun to somebody's head at the end of it. And if you pull that gun away, I don't think we can truly calculate what the outcome of that would be in the short to midterm. Okay. But I consider well, what the positives might be. Oh, there's p plenty of positives, but not for the United States. Really? The so United if, if we, instead of spending, let's say a trillion dollars a year on to, so we take a trillion dollars a year out of the economy that produces good things, right? More or less. To, to fund our war efforts. This goes into I don't hold, know what logical wait, fallacy wait, or hold on, false. Hold on, on. Wait, hold on. I'm just I'm just asking. We're taking about a trillion dollars a year out of uh, the economy that produces good things to fund our war efforts. Is that more or less right? You could position it that way. Okay. Um, and with those trillions of dollars, well, with a trillion dollars a year, you would take. Um, we are also removing a lot of people out of the workforce that could be producing goods and ideas and other things that um, would benefit people in the United States or around the world, right? Because they'd, they'd be workers and they'd be producing things versus destroying things. Is that fair? 
ostensibly provided that yeah. there was a consumer for those goods and services on the other end, which is no guarantee, um, but well, 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 no, because it's, because it's certainly a possibility. Because basically, uh, a lot of those people would end up being entrepreneurs or working for entrepreneurs, and that's that's basically what we have. Except possible, we're, we're, but that's not guaranteed. It's not guaranteed well, well, hold, that the kid you take out of the pits of Detroit, right, who no, was no, who but, gets but, sent but, off to. If you, if you look at history, training. if you look at history, right, um, in the year I don't know eighteen hundred, right, where would these people be if not in a federal army? they'd be working for somebody else, right? They'd be farming, probably. Well, right, before tractors. But when tractors came along, uh, they would end up working yet for somebody else, mm -hmm. right? And uh, we know throughout history, every time that, that advancements come along, people will always find work somewhere because what happens in the economy is they go, hey, look, there's there's cheap labor, right? I can make my attempt at being an entrepreneur because I can afford workers to actually do a thing. And then we hire those workers. Uh, so the the concept that if, the, if uh, they weren't working for the army, that if they wouldn't be able to find work or start companies or something like that, I, I don't think it jives with uh, economics historically. I'm not saying that it's not possible. What no, I'm, no, saying I'm, I'm saying is you can't just say it's a guaranteed outcome. Well, well I would say it's the likely outcome because uh, show me where unemployment was was you know aside from the you know the twenties where the federal government uh, fucked up the the uh, economy where these people uh, couldn't find work you know so you you would I, I could I could show you throughout history but back to the Roman what about, times that these but people what about find work. what about when your groceries cost five hundred percent more. Because all the privilege that was attained from no, our no, military no, no, might no, around on, the world. No, no, hold on, hold on. Okay, so uh, again, you're assuming that uh, this would happen as opposed to like, hey, you know, we would have uh, more farms and more capability to grow things here because, first of all, we're not hiring the best engineers into developing bombs, but now they can make better uh, tractors or, or food or where, wherever the economy is saying, hey, we want more focus here hire more people for that. And instead of taking those people away and taking funds away from that, we actually have the capability. Look at the advancement between 1800 and, you know, uh, 1920, give or take. Right. So I think this actually falls back to what we were talking about before, which is, is it directionally superior than the direction we're pointed right now? Right. Because right now we're in expansive military position versus contracting. And I agree that it is desirable to create a world in which there's less war and more prosperity for everybody. But, but how do you get to the, same... point? The, the prosperity comes from people making stuff. Again, it, like, I don't know how uh, familiar you are with uh, the Austrian economic model of things, but it's uh, you, you put uh, people you make people available to a workforce um, and prosperity takes it from there. Uh, it like history is literally full of that is the path. It's not like people just sit around or, or they form gangs and stuff. It's well, it, it, that's a possibility. You know, it's, it's not all gang yeah. and con if, <laughs> but, but you look, you look at history. Uh, I, I don't know if you know Thomas Sowell, look at his uh, like almost any of his books. Cause he, he likes to introduce a lot of history uh, into his uh, economics books. And by the way, they're very readable. It, it's like uh, he does it in very plain language. It's not like uh, it's all formulas and stuff like the Keynesian economic stuff. But uh, like everything from basic, his book, uh, number one book, I, I would say basic, basic economics in forward. And you see how uh, people in economics works. And I know you're saying like, well, we can't assume that, that this would have this effect, except historically, that's exactly what it does. Um. And I'm not disagreeing that in a vacuum that that would be true. So like assume China doesn't exist. Assume our immediate need in the short term to have favorable trade terms in order to have price of goods be anything even remotely comparable to what's available today. Because the country is on the verge of collapse economically when you look at individuals. Individual people are not doing great on the whole. 
right? As a total economy, we're doing great because at the top end, it's going fucking gangbusters, minting more billionaires than we've ever conceived. What I'm talking about is, okay, so let's say, and it goes right back to what we were talking about before in terms of directional versus like Thanos snap. I think that some people believe, okay, we'll just bring all the troops home, close all the bases, you know, stop all the foreign interference with governments and elections and running proxy wars through Ukraine and all these other things. In the short term, I am fervently convinced that the short term outcome of that would be unbelievably catastrophic to the United States because there are not good. We're not surrounded by goodwill actors and we we're don't surrounded have by people who are looking to exploit any weakness at any time to gain power, control, and influence. And there's a lot of vague language there. Okay. Um, you know, any weakness, at any, like a, a lot of people looking for any weakness at any time. Uh, you know, I, I'm just saying there's a lot of vague language, language right there. And it's very so difficult to- be more to, specific. Well, China, uh, Russia, it, Iran. Great. Okay. Saudi so Arabia. What is, fine. Uh, great. Iran. What is Iran looking to do? Iran is looking to expand its power and influence in the global theater. I think and it's going to hurt us. Well, they control a pretty sizable amount of petroleum as far as I understand. So do we. So do we. And we could However, be energy we could be net energy exporters, you know that, right? I do know that. Right. Okay. So so how is Iran that. Right. But but it's not, right, but again it's not like we can't if we wanted to, right? So what it, what threat does Iran pose to us? Well, to your point before, the number one thing, the number one risk factor for us economically is the dollar as a petrol reserve currency. And if we suddenly withdraw the guns to everybody's heads all around the world, there's a whole lot less incentive for people to give a fuck about the U.S. dollar. That's just, I think, an unrecognized fact. Now, can I demonstrate that through some series of proofs? I can't. But there's there's no real valid, like, logical reason why the U.S. dollar should be a reserve currency, especially as we're getting into a point where... Um, right. Br BRICS is a threat to the petrol dollar. Um, yes. Right. But I, I'm I'm failing to see uh, how Iran is going to be a threat to us. I was listing them as an and it's well, well placed in terms of the the country in which you selected to have me go deep on as they well, are certainly you, you, the least you, threatening. You, well, you listed them as as one of the countries. I was curious what uh, what threat they posed because it was on your list. That's the only reason I brought it up. Well. Other than being a disruption to the petrol dollar, I don't think they pose a terrible threat because we're not we're not intertwined right. with them with right. a lot of good production. Um, so I would say they're the the least the least threatening of the major concerns globally. Right. Okay. But but are are they any real threat to us whatsoever? What like what what are they going to do that's going to hurt us? You know, and again, yeah, the petrol dollar, but I'm like, the petrol dollar is threatened by BRICS and overall, let's say, questionable economic policy, um, you know, which can only last so long. Uh, what is Iran? Is Iran at all a threat to us? Uh, well, it's a it's a good question, actually, because if we remove ourselves from the 4D chess game, it matters a lot less. Why is Iran such a big problem? Well, because they threaten Israel and they threaten Saudi Arabia and they threaten places that have strategic and alliance based uh, impact on us. Okay, but if so we're no longer playing if, all those if, games. If they're, if they're threatening, uh, what is it, you said Israel? Yeah. Um, what, what does that have to do with us? Well, if assuming that we withdrew all of this support. We're, we're playing global cop, right? It doesn't. 
it's a, I'm saying that that's a fairly good point that I hadn't considered that if we leave everybody else to defend themselves, then there's a lot fewer, um, you know, catastrophic impacts to us, but it goes back to the point of we would have to increase our ability to produce goods and particularly food. Well, now really um, fucking quickly. Well, I mean, imagine if we had uh, several hundred thousand more people in the workforce, and a lot of those people were some of the smartest engineers that had previously been working on bombs and all of this other stuff. And they came back and they entered the market and the market, you know, the people who are already here who are running companies that do this stuff had access uh, and they were now flooded with really good engineers. Mm. Right. And they're like, oh, my God, look at all these look at all these brilliant people. <laughs> and they're all looking for work. This is great. You know, let's get them solving these problems for us. It well, would be a very interesting short term problem to solve. I think long term, the outcome would be very beneficial, assuming that there's not some kind of global. Um, like what happens if suddenly China invades all of Asia, right? Because Taiwan China is all of Asia. <laughs> say China well, is like, all of Asia. China is all of Asia. Well, like. Okay, let's say China invades Mongolia. <laughs> you know, so no, but let's say China invades Korea, mm -hmm. South Korea, and Japan, and Taiwan, right? Mm -hmm. And places yep. that are c currently of strategic importance, not just because they're friendly, but because like that's where we get our chips and other silicon-based shit from, and we have very tight. Right, we we, you know, we get a lot of chips from China. We get a lot of uh, core uh, materials from China. But a lot of the chips also, the, the ma machines made that actually make those chips, uh, I believe Holland, of all places. <laughs> uh, there, there's a lot of things that we have that were effectively engineered uh, and built in Holland for some weird We have to take a look at their school system, I'm telling you. Uh, but, well, I, you know. Um, but, yeah, but, yeah, so there's always going to be short-term disruption. It's just like when uh, tractors hit, uh, you know, hit the farms. So and like, let's, sudden, let's yeah. do a thought exercise. What happens if now the U S has withdrawn its big brother complex and we pull back all our troops and we cut our defense spending by, you know, four fifths or some very large percentage. Mm -hmm. And we start investing in agriculture and other things to make ourselves more self-sufficient and less dependent internationally. Well, and again, it doesn't have to be like all internationally because like, what, why can't we trade with England and well, we Europe sure, and we, Canada? We certainly could. Right. However, those countries probably wouldn't exist as standalone countries for terribly long because it's really – You think England will fall to whom? I think there will be a march across Europe from Russia at gunpoint seizing control and just m massacring people you, as you they think, gobble them up. You, you think Russia is going to take Europe? I think the reason why Russia hasn't taken Ukraine is because of the U.S. spending and military force. I think sans that they would have Correct, already but do you think it. Russia wants to take Europe? Yes. Hmm. All right. And God knows what China wants. Surely all of Asia Pacific. Well, we know so, they want Taiwan. <laughs> so for sure. So let's just pretend that let's go with a theoretical thought exercise. Call it devil's advocate, if you will. What happens if Russia controls from where they are today through through all of Europe and China controls all of Asia Pacific? And there's some unfriendly coalition that now controls all of South America. What does that mean for the U.S. <laughs> long term? <laughs> Just the scenario is so weird. It's like saying, like, well, what if Canada has taken over Africa? You know, I don't like, think it's that no, weird. Hold, hold on, no, no, hold on, hold on. But, but it's like uh, you're saying. Um, Why okay, is I'm Taiwan gonna, hold, independent hold on, wait, today? Wait, hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on. You're saying, hey, I'm going to give you the scenario, you know, and I'm going to set it up where the U.S. is effectively fucked, and you tell me what we could do about it. Oh, I'm not saying right? they're fucked. But think no, about no, that. But, but, Leo, it's not that crazy. Hold on, hold on, it's not hold on, the crazy extension of logic. 
already China wants to take over imperialistically other territory. Already, Russia wants to take over imperialistically other territory. I see no well, it, rational reason why, should they succeed what? in doing that, they would not extend it to another piece of territory. And so you just, what's the time horizon over which you play that out? It's fucking the game of risk. That's all it I, I is. Ha I haven't seen any evidence that Russia wants to take over Europe. Okay, fair I, enough. You know, I, but that doesn't I, I, mean I they don't want to reclaim everything that once was the USSR, which is a stated goal of Putin. Um, and then he's going to die eventually. And then who says that the next person right. who comes in, to your point, evil plus one, if, if, isn't going to want to go do more? Do, do, do you think that Putin started the uh, uh, the war in Ukraine just because he wants uh, part or all of Ukraine just for the heck of it? Or No, I think it's a problem with the Black Sea. I think he's got real serious concerns about being able to to get goods in and out of his country and also to have a, a wall against NATO so that he doesn't end up getting invaded or crippled in some way. Right. I think it's largely so, a defensive so, move. Right. So do you see where there seems to be a big disconnect between a largely defensive move, as you put it, and him – going, hey, you know, we should try to take Germany. <laughs> no, but he has stated publicly that he intends to reunite the entire USSR. Okay, and you stated that he's going to go across Europe and take England. What do, I'm, do, I'm not do, saying hold he. On, hold on, hold on. Is, I didn't say he, I said Russia. Uh -huh. He will die one day and someone he's, else will rise and want to be more important and more significant and bigger Power corrupts. I don't see any reason why the next person who steps up is going to be like, you know what we should do? We should actually relinquish territory that we re-annexed. Like, I, I think there's a big difference between back. that and going after Germany, for example. You know? I, personally, I think it would be a matter of time. Uh, I, I guess the, it, it's hard for me to, to address this because you're imagining – uh, this unknown person who has these particular ways of thinking, and it just I don't see where where the well, logic to leads your point before it's Germany. all of human history. How many empires have existed that from the moment they were formed, they just tried to get bigger until they could no longer until they were so thin they could no longer sustain their size and they collapse. That has been human history in a nutshell. So I don't see any and, reason and when, why that would suddenly change. So, so you think the the current state of the world and world powers and knowledge and everything else is about the same as, let's say, 1900? Because that's that, that's absurd question. So obviously not. Well, but if you're if you're saying you know throughout history this is how empires have acted, the uh, the reason why it's not happening currently is because of nuclear weapons. Nuclear okay. weapons are both the and, single most destructive thing that's ever happened and the single most peace-causing event that's okay. occurred. Okay, so, so how does that enter into your – the guy who's going to take over Germany? I think it's a game of chicken. Who's willing to use it? Well, I, I could tell you that the U.S. is willing to use it because – I know we've only used it once, but if you look at uh, the people who've talked about the behind the scenes of like literally almost every single large conflict we've had, we there were people talking to the president that they wanted to use nuclear uh, weapons in Vietnam. They wanted to use them in uh, in uh, the Middle East with uh, uh, Iraq. You know, it, I'm like, and Vietnam. I'm like, I don't know. I don't really know what the state of the nation was back then. I'm like. Well, that seems a bit extreme. But then it's like, well, we were talking about the same thing in, in uh, you know, 2003 or whatever with Iraq. It's like the people running the government have no qualms, it seems, about using nuclear weapons, except whoever is in charge has enough things like, I don't think I want to be that guy who says yes. But his advisors are. So I, I don't think uh, nuclear weapons are really uh, far out of the possibility of being used 
by the U.S. because, again, advisors to the president keep suggesting it. And if we have a president like Biden, because, come on, he's not making the decision. Somebody's going to tell him, like, yeah, you know, sign these papers, sign this. This is what we got to do. And he's like, oh, I don't know. And like, sir, like, this has to be done. And Well, I guess here's my personal opinion on it, and that's all it is is an opinion. Yeah. If you're trying to optimize for U.S. safety and prosperity, I think over the medium to long term, you're absolutely right. I think we could produce a whole lot and we could guard ourselves. We have fucking Canada to the north and fucking Mexico to the south. We don't have a ton to worry about when it comes to like self-defense. And then we've got two enormous oceans on either side, right? We're, we're energy positive. positive. And we're energy positive. We have a lot of natural resources on our own soil. So and we I have a lot of production we, we, capability. I know people we have think a lot that of production. We, 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 I don't know. A lot of people think we've exported a lot of our production overseas, but we haven't. We produce more nowadays in U.S. based factories than we did, uh, you know, 30 years ago. The only difference is that uh, it, it's uh, more automation than uh, than factory work. Right. The, jo uh, the jobs left. But but well, sh they shifted because somebody has to make those things and run them here. But if you're asking, how do we optimize for less suffering around the world and less the lowest number of war related deaths? I don't know if that's the same answer. In fact, my gut tells me strongly it's not. I think we would have overnight a dozen Ukraines across the world if this U.S. suddenly pulled itself entirely back. And so it goes to the broader question, what are we optimizing for? Which goes to the exact example I was giving around guns versus, you know, um, education around health. Like, what are we optimizing for? Are we optimizing for optics and the things that, you know, people cry about when they watch it on TV? Or are we actually trying to save more lives? Because you could save more lives by teaching people how to have responsible uh, care for their pools in their backyard so kids don't fucking drown in them. You could save more lives doing that than all the money and time you spend on uh, gun control. Because I when think that the... When you're talking about the world, um, again, on the one hand, uh, I, I don't think uh, that we're qualified to help the world. Uh, he showed me one place that we've actually helped you know, in the past 50 years. Um, you know, we, we spread way more destruction um, and, and misery. Uh, we fund more terrorists than anybody else in the world. Um, and uh, I don't we, necessarily we, disagree, but what we don't see is what would be in, a, in the absence. Right. Well, that's the thing is for that, I think you would have to be more familiar with economics and how that stuff works. Um, because when you stop taking resources, and again, it's not just money, but it's it's those mental resources where you're taking excellent workers, but you're also taking very brilliant and smart people who uh, have to work these very complicated systems or design them. But we and... seem to agree with the Taiwan situation. So let's use that as the steel man or straw man. What happens to the people of Taiwan if we no longer defend them? What does that annexation exercise look like? I certainly don't think it looks peaceful. Yeah, I'd say if the Taiwanese don't, don't want to be part of China, they should leave. You know, because China's going to come in there and grab it. But I don't think, look at it this way. There's a guy down the street currently, down the street from you, beating his wife. Right? Sorry, Odds second. Are, there's a guy down the street right now from you somewhere beating his wife. Beating should his you, wife, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Should you go down there and, and set him straight? And then the next guy, and then the next guy, because, you know, you have a family and a job and things that you're trying to do. This is and... a thought exercise I go through regularly, actually. Like, what, oh, is, the, what, is, the, what is the best use of... Uh... It, I don't think it's necessarily the, the best use of. It's the uh, uh, fix your... Well, it's a Jordan Peterson thing of fix yourself yeah. first, make your room, you know. Yeah. Uh, and if you can't make your room and keep your house in order and all of these things, stop going over there <laughs> and spending your energy there. You have well, to. I think I brought it up. First. I think it brought it up when we were talking about one of the things that we could discuss tonight, 
is the notion of um, philanthropy at a distance. Is it even worth it? Is it even possible to have a positive outcome? Leave it to the individuals. Yeah, because the more I think about it, Leo, I really truly believe that the only real good you can do in the world is to basically heal yourself and take care of your immediate friends and family around you. Anything beyond that, and you're going to have second, third, fourth order effects that you don't, you can't possibly understand that are going to ultimately create a more negative outcome than if you hadn't participated. Yeah, I think you could go to those third and fourth things, but you, but you shouldn't jump there because you haven't shown enough expertise to keep your own house in order. You know, uh, and like we're, we're spending, well, you know, let's say the past couple of years, uh, we're spending over a hundred billion dollars uh, to get Ukrainians to kill themselves fighting Russia. And if you listen to uh, the people in the U.S. Uh, government talk about it, they're happy to do it to destroy Russia's military capability. And they don't give a shit about the Ukrainians. hundred um, percent agree with that. And well, because they've, they've actually done the, the math breakdown of the uh, the cost of us uh, directly fighting Russia, like dollar for dollar, like our economy versus theirs, versus uh, getting Ukraine to do it uh, without us spending really anything but money, none of our equipment, and none of, you know, because any equipment we sell, we, we're sending over to Ukraine, Ukraine is paying for uh, through loans, long-term loans. Uh, you know, and people are looking at that and going, like, do we not have problems that we could spend that money here in the U.S.? How many homeless, how many starving people, our education, all of this. We left, what uh, what, what was it? It was, uh, it was tens of billions of dollars for our enemies in, uh, was it Iran? When, when we left the bases, we left all the military equipment there. Oh, Afghanistan. Uh, Afghanistan. And tens of millions of dollars in cash on pallets. <laughs> I'm like, if you're going to take any, like, ah. Uh, but but this is the thing funny. is right. But the thing is, so it's nothing. It's literally nothing new. The the Pentagon has failed their fifth audit. Um, they can't recently. account for like trillions of dollars in assets. This is this is what I'm saying. It, it, the uh, our we can't fix things here, and we're we're trying to fix things elsewhere. And we have again, like I can't think of a single place where, that we didn't fuck up <laughs> by sending military or money there. You know why uh, you're right, Leo? Because habit. <laughs> uh, because at the end of the day, all of those decisions are made out of fear and not love. And I think that in this world, the good, the true, and the beautiful, that triangle of things is represented by love. And if you focus on loving action, loving thought, and it, it's a courageous act because it has to be done in the face of fear, right? To pull back and let China and Russia be, be what they're going to be. And we're going to do our thing and take care of ourselves and do our best over here. That takes courage because it it's frightening to think of a red wave across Asia and Europe and whatever. But I think, I think it's correct because the most loving thing we can do is to take care of ourselves such that we could even be in a place to ever help someone else. Cause to your point, we are so fucking dysfunctional. There's, there's no additional good we're doing. Libya is no better off for our intervention. Iraq is no better off for our intervention. Afghanistan, sure as shit, is no better off for our intervention. Or, or Iraq. I, I don't know if you mentioned Iraq in that list. I uh, did. Yeah. The, uh, the, uh, man, if you, if you ever listen to uh, the Vietnam uh, soldiers that were talking about the shit that they were doing to the Vietnamese, <laughs> It's like, I'm sorry, are we there to help? It, it sounds like we're, we're torturing whole villages full of people. Um, yeah. But, uh, well, so here's an interesting thing that you said. The, uh, I, I disagree with the, uh, with the love thing, but only because, uh, and, and it, it gets into economics, and uh, there's, a, there's a book, uh, Economics in One, in One Lesson by a fellow named Henry Hazlitt, uh, 
And it's just all, all he does is the one point he drives home is how to when you make an economic uh, policy. People only look at the immediate result of it. Uh, they don't look at the long term result for the same thing. They don't look at the immediate results for uh, adjacent things or the long term result for adjacent things. And I have an interesting uh, example for this in Africa where people with the best of intentions did things which ended up hurting Africa. But you also uh, said uh, in like, what is the best way to do it? And that's really that's really, I think, the core of the question. Everybody wants to do good. Hitler thought he was helping you know, the German people. <laughs> the question I, is like, I believe that, by the way. Um, the question is like, what is actually the the best action to take that will help? And also with that, uh, what is what are some of the actions that we could be taking which are uh, would end up hurting things? And I'm going to toss out two examples, and you could take it anywhere you want from that. Uh, the uh, the the more uh, well studied example was uh, when uh, people wanted uh, people in China. I don't know, it was China, it was, it was something over there in in, in Asia. Uh, they wanted to shut down the sweatshops, and so this was like a big thing in the '80s and the '90s. Uh, a lot of the people in the U.S. were like, "Oh, you know, look at the kids working in these sweatshops. We got to shut them down." And uh, and so the U.S. you know the U.S. and the company said, "Yeah, we can't do business any there there anymore," and and uh, shut. Uh, they shut down the sweatshops. They moved them somewhere else, <laughs> but they shut down the, the ones that people were complaining about. Uh, but afterwards, uh, economists went in and they did some studies of like, you know, what's up with these sweatshops and what happens to the people. And it turns out that um, on average, sweatshop workers were paid more than the median income in that area. So they were actually sought after jobs. And right. the other thing that they found was that in a lot of these places, uh, some of the reasons that the kids were working there was that if the kids didn't work in that family, the family would end up starving. So it kept people from starving. So shutting down those sweatshops put kids out of work so they had to take jobs for less money. And their families would start to start, or in sex work, or in and, God knows and that, what. That actually, the sex work was the was the next thing I was going to say. It's like, well, the next best paying thing was sex work, and that's not a good good result either. Um, so the second example is in Africa. There was a shoe company, and this was all actually like I want to say maybe only five years ago. Uh, everything seems like last month, but it turns out when I look into it, it was like five or ten years ago. I'm like, God damn it! Um, and uh, it was a shoe company. And they get, hey, you know what? Uh, for every pair of shoes you buy, and granted we're charging a little bit more, they're a little bit more expensive. We're going to send a pair of shoes to villages in Africa that you know the kids are shoeless, and people are like, hey, you know, and they bought those. And I don't know. Do you know the story? No. Do you know? What, can you imagine what happened? Like, what's the bad thing that came out of this? So they're sending a pair of shoes to the villages where the people are making them. Uh, no, no, no. The the shoes are made here in the U.S. Okay. And if you, Matt, buy a pair of shoes, you paid extra, and another pair of shoes will be sent to uh, villages in Africa. So basically, you're buying two pair of shoes, and one of them is being sent off to Africa where they don't have shoes. Um, blah, 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 blah. I can't well, think of it. And, and this is the thing. It's really complicated stuff to you. Like, what, why, why would I even think of that? Uh, they put local shoemakers out of business. Mm. And then the people who supplied them with their goods and materials were also suffering. <laughs> so, like, they put out several different types of businesses there. So now they created more unemployed people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so it was like, uh, it's it's very, like, you need, like, so many examples of this kind of stuff to kind of start guessing at, like, when somebody brings you a new example, what it might affect because it's really weird. Did you ever read the book Ishmael? Uh, I don't think I have. It's fantastic. I haven't read it in some time. I actually need to reread it now that I've been through this sort of spiritual journey. One of the things that's brought up as a thought exercise in the book is if you've got a hundred million starving people in Africa and you send them a bunch of food, such mm -hmm. that they are no longer starving. 
and nothing changes about the culture or the education or the awareness or anything. In one generation, you're going to have 300 million starving people in Africa. And I thought that that was a really fascinating thought experiment because it flies in the face of everything that you would think and how we're brought up here in the U S which is, you know, give and, you know, just be as philanthropic as you can. And if you're, you know, helping save people, obviously that's a great thing. Well, it's a question of what do you mean by safe? This, I, I don't know if I learned this from Jordan Peterson. I, I think he certainly brought it out in me more. I ask a lot more. What do you mean by that word? Yeah. <laughs> And I mean, in this particular instance, you would say, well, they don't starve to death. And it's like, okay, but what is it? Is that more desirable to save this one person to then have three more starving people a generation later? And I think it's, it's a really interesting. Oh, I think thing. I, wait, is it because the population increased? Correct. Oh, okay. Sorry. I was looking at a completely different point of, point of, uh, point of view where the people were starving because. Uh, basically, you put a lot of people who produced food out of business. No, no. You know, like, I'm saying like there's people who are just literally cannot get enough nutrition or can't get enough clean water or insert something right. here. And we just ship nothing but money, right? Change nothing else about culture, education, whatever. Just ship money over. And now all of a sudden they have water and food. And then they're not going to just not have more kids because that's just what happens. Congo is going to be the most populous country in the world within probably 50 years uh, based on like current projections. And I think what it, it, what it uncovers is that we as humans are really fucking bad at multi-order effects. We're, we're okay. Some of us well, it, I think it's first just order effects. I think it's just training. It's just like you, if you don't know about uh, you know how to think about the logical fallacies and stuff, you yeah. don't know how to find you know bits of like true facts, and you know we're not trained to think of these multi-order effects like you're talking about, and so I think we can. And the more time I spend uh, studying economics, the easier it is for me to to see stuff like that. So like when you yeah. say if we send the food, what's going to happen? I'm like oh like I I've seen examples of this, you know, <laughs> and. So I think it's I think it's possible, uh, but it, again, it's not like you know literally anybody trains you for it. Um, Leo, I'm gonna have to call it because I got to get my ass up early in the morning. I go to seven a.m. with my uh, chief sales officer to talk about some fun stuff about a client uh, we're working on. I got to say, this has been one of my absolute favorite conversations I've had. This was uh, very thought provoking, and I love. Uh, I love having my thought processes be challenged. So I appreciate you. Um, well, thanks. I'm going to, uh, I guess I, I can link them to you, but uh, I'll tell you two books I recommend. Uh, you know, and, uh, I imagine you have a, quite a reading list. You seem like the sort. Um, uh, Henry Hazlitt, uh, Economics in One Lesson. It's a very short book, um, but it, it's a good intro. Uh, Thomas Sowell's uh, Basic Economics. Uh, it's a lot of the same stuff, uh, but it's oh, so readable. And the the fact that he puts so many things from history in there, it's it's like the best uh, history channel show that you could ask for. Was it Thomas Howell, you said? S Sowell, S-O-W-E-L-L. Um, and, and what, and actually, was that, what was that book again? Uh, Basic Economics. Are um, either and, of these audible friendly or do they have a lot of visuals? Uh, no, but, but uh, both of them uh, perfectly audible friendly. And uh, uh, Thomas Sowell's Basic Economics also available for free on YouTube as an audio thing. Nice. Um, and uh, I will send you a link to uh, – it's a short episode by a company called Reason. Um, and they do these little uh, – the government made these policies with the best of intentions. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> and it's like one-minute-long examples of – Hey, this was the problem. This was the introduced solution, and this is what went wrong. Ooh, I love that. Yeah, so they have uh, like I don't know, like eight episodes, seven or eight episodes right now, 
they cover three items in each one, and the whole video is like three or four minutes long total. Do they cover uh, anything on like econ or not economic, but uh, like ecological choices? Like, I, I actually, I, I think bred the gypsy their... moth, or we introduce you know pigs to Hawaii and all this well, other stupid shit. Two, two of those popped to mind. One was uh, they wanted to rebuild reefs by uh, sinking tires, so they need to get rid of old rubber tires. They go, hey, you know, we could use this to build a reef. Okay, and. Uh, well, I, I will leave it to you to watch the videos for what went wrong. Okay. Um, and the other one, I think uh, more recently they covered uh, China's war against the sparrows, which I don't know if you're familiar with. Uh, not. But yeah, so I think it was under Mao, they had a war against the sparrows, and uh, uh, there was a bounty on their heads, and they killed so many sparrows. And uh, well, obviously the bugs got out of control after that. <laughs> but they. <laughs> You know, it's uh, it, it yeah, it's it's a marvelous series. I'll send you a link, um, and there we go. I'd love that. And for anybody who made it to the end of this, we'll find that in the <laughs> show notes. Thank you, Leo. I'd uh, I'd really like to do this again sometime. This is sure uh, super productive. I feel we're gonna like... have to narrow our our conversations. I think. <laughs> I, I like the sprawling. <laughs> it, it's it's your podcast. You do what you want. Um, well, if you, if but, you but have if a you want to go topic, let's go deep on it. Well, and, and that's what I was going to say. If you want to uh, be deeper on any particular thing, because like we, again, we did uh, cover a lot of things. But if you want to dig down in any particular thing, uh, you know, put it on the list, and and uh, I could do some thinking about it and some some research, and uh, we could see where we get to. Um, dialectic. That's that's the. I don't know if you know this word. I only learned it a few years ago. There's a, a professor, Brett Weinstein, got thrown out of mm. uh, Evergreen. But yep. in one of his uh, videos where he was trying to face his students, he said, look, I, I'm just interested in, in dialectic. And I'm like, what the hell is that? And uh, evidently, it's a conversation in pursuit of truth. So it's different from debates because debate, I'm trying to convince somebody to believe me more than you. And uh, dialectic is just kind of like a Socratic, like, well, I have a question. What about this? Like, what, what do we like? How would that enter in? And it's just you continue with with questions and what we know, and you come up to like, well, as best as we could figure, it might be something like this. I'm like, I kind of like that approach. <laughs> so there it's my go. favorite approach. It's you know, what I can't remember the phrase. It's a uh... Like strongly, strongly defended beliefs held loosely, something like mm. that. It's like, you know, I'll come in with a lot of, you know, salt and pepper, but as soon as, as soon as I'm presented with something that is logical enough to change my mind, like I'll just abandon my position and say, oh, actually that makes more sense. Cause. And that's the thing. I don't think anybody has ever changed like mid conversation, uh, but it's like one of those, like, well, you bring up questions and, and, and things, and then they think over it, and they go, you know, there, there may be something to that. Uh, but it, it's uh, you have to let people well, – the, 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 you have to lead – you have to uh, let them smell the food and let them come into the kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> you, can't, you can't shove their face in the fries. A lot, a lot of people – I would say virtually all people, their egos are not ready to accept a complete change of position in the middle of a conversation. Yeah, well, because but I think it's also the right thing, uh, because you have to, if you, if you swear, if you were so uh, little convinced of your own beliefs that you're willing to switch mid conversation, um, it, it would seem like every okay, your flip flop. Yes, I, well, we, we worked with one of these people. I'm not going to name any names, <laughs> but they held a position of authority of the company. And uh, they would hold a conversation with me, and then they would go to a different department and hold a conversation with them, and then come back to me and hold a conversation. And it was just like I'm arguing with a different department for a middleman. <laughs> I am familiar with this person and dynamic. Not um, um, yeah. Well, good stuff, sir. Well, thank you again. Appreciate your time and your candor and uh, your fervor. And uh, it was great to catch up as well. Yeah. Um, do this again next year. Yeah, or, well, yeah. Maybe this year. We have a whole 12 months. All right. Uh, All right, good night. Good luck. Thank you. Cheers. Best of luck in 23. Yeah. Bye-bye.